Okay, whenever whenever you're ready, Elaine. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm presenting on the literature review for module two, which focuses on health, air quality, and environmental justice. Um, so I just popped in the definition of environmental justice from OS 101, which is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just give a small little PM 2.5 overview. Um, the data set from CTAC um, um, is like on a daily and yearly basis across the United States. It is a one kilometer resolution and it helps serve public health research for estimating short and long-term impacts on human health and facilitating related investigations and annual PM 2.5 predictions result from averaging failure estimates within each grid cell for each year. So there's one uh, literature review that was done on it by D et al. 2019. It proposes an example model for estimating daily 2.5 levels across the United States at a one kilometer times one kilometer resolution and integrates multiple machine learning algorithms and uses various predictive variables such as satellite data, meteorological variables, land use variables, elevation, chemical transfer model predictions, and reanalysis data sets. Um, they were the predictions were made at the one at the normal resolution and then downscaled to 100 meters times 100 meters using localized land use variables. It helps aim it helps um, epidemiologists assess the health effects of PM 2.5. And the study suggests that the ensemble model provides better overall estimation compared to individual base learners. And there is a potential for exploring other ensemble formats to enhance overall performance. Um, then there is the GRDI, which stands for Global Credit Relative Rep uh, Deprivation Index. Um, it characterizes multi-dimensional deprivation and poverty across the world at a one kilometer times one kilometer resolution. The index is based on six components, including child dependency ratios, infant mortality rates, subnational human development index, buildup area ratios, and nighttime lights. It uses weighted sociodemographic and satellite data inputs. Um, and the data set spans from 2010 to 2020. And then there's also the SVI, which stands for Social Vulnerability Index, and it refers to the potential negative effects on communities caused by external stresses on human health. Um, these stresses can include natural or human-caused disasters and disease outbreaks. And the SVI uses a total of 16 U.S. Census variables that have four domains or themes, and that includes socioeconomic status, household composition, composition and disability, minority status and language, and housing type and transportation. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the literature reviews. I try to divide it into health, environmental justice, and air quality, but there's a lot of overlap. Um, so this study focuses on identifying census tract neighborhood hotspots using the PICU, which stands for Pediatric Intensive Care Use, admission rates for life-threatening asthma, um, and the hypothesis was that neighborhood hotspots would concentrate on poorer populations, um, which would be, which include, which would include a higher measure of social vulnerability and a low measure of childhood opportunity and the Childhood Opportunity Index uses census tract information and quantifies how the neighborhood education, um, quantifies neighborhood education, socioeconomic conditions, and, res and resources which encourage healthy childhood development. The results showed that 16.3% of children were living within a neighborhood hotspot. There were no differences in median age, sex, ethnicity, admission hospital, prior asthma diagnosis, or duration of hospitalization between children who lived inside or outside the hotspot. Um, but children living in the hotspot relied more on public health care, were more likely to be admitted 
to the local hospital campus and lived in a home closer to a primary or secondary road roadway. So basically children with the, within these hotspots had greater social vulnerability, vulnerability and less child opportunity and black and Hispanic children were more likely to be hospitalized with life-threatening asthma compared to non-Hispanic white children. Um, this one is another study focusing on health. Um, this one evaluates whether hospitalized patients with COVID-19 experienced higher death rates or major adverse cardiovascular events, um, which can be called MACE or MACES. The SVI was used to classify county level social vulnerability of patients' homes, and they evaluated the correlation between SVI, hospital death rates, and MACE, and each of the 15. Um, basically, the website for the SVI says that there are 16 variables, but I think um, when this study was done, there were only 15 SVI variables. But um, yeah, they were ranked from lowest to highest vulnerability across census tracts in the United States. And the results showed that 25% of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 that lived in the most socially vulnerable countries were more likely to experience an in-hospital death. Um, socially vulnerable patients were also more likely to experience MACE. Um, this could be due to crowded living situations, so also working frontline jobs um, that like requires talking to people, such as retail jobs, um, which could increase the viral load in socially, socially vulnerable communities. And people in these communities also experienced higher pollution and climate patterns such as high humidity and temperature can increase contact with COVID-19. Um, this one focuses on the role of the urban heat island effect and air quality on environmental and social vulnerability. So basically find particular matter um, smaller than 2.5 micrometers or PM 2.5 and ozone has caused death related to poor air quality, which is also related, related to an increase in temperature and higher populated areas tend to suffer extreme heat events and higher pollution levels. So this, this study used three indices to quantify the factors affecting air quality associated with the urban, urban heat island effect. That was the SVI, the environmental risk, risk impact index, which is used to identify locations associated with environmental risk linked with urban heat island and the health impact index, which is used to help public health professionals focus on areas that need essential health care and education regarding urban heat island effects. And the results showed that 53 to 56% of census grids lie within the medium high um, environmental risk impact index, SVI, and the HII, and certain neighborhoods were found to be at higher risk of urban heat island and air pollution. Um, this study focuses mostly on air quality, and it focuses on combining meteorological hazards, which they labeled as PM2.5 or trophosphoric ozone, and vulnerability data to identify areas that are at greater risk of health hazards. Um, they mostly focused on New England and the results showed that SVI is possibly correlated with every type of meteorological hazard um, with the strongest correlation observed with the heat index. Um, and race and ethnicity SVI exhibited greater spatial correlations across all hazards, especially for excessive heat areas with concentrated um, social vulnerability had greater probabilities of experience. Health hazardous days, especially from excessive heat, hot spots experience more excessive heat days for warm season and areas with higher probabilities of health hazardous hot spots had greater mean values of social vulnerability across the overall SVI, household conversation SVI and race ethnicity and language SVI. Um, this study focused on the effects of redlining on air pollution near New York City schools. So redlining is basically a discriminatory housing practice that started in the 1930s that categorized neighborhoods based on 
racial demographics and mortgage investment risk. So basically um, areas that they considered to be, that had more minorities had a uh, lower, had a higher mortgage investment risk. Um, and these lower grade neighborhoods were predominantly Black, Asian, Hispanic, and non-Western European house households. And even though redlining was outlawed in 1968, the effects are still persistent and it has contributed to racial and economic segregation, social and environmental inequalities, and increased health problems. Um, so we, the results show that historically redlined neighborhoods in New York City had higher levels of air pollution compared to other neighborhoods. Um, these areas had a higher prevalence of Black residents, um, higher DI, I did not, um, I forgot to mention what the I and COI is. Um, and they experienced elevated levels of diesel emissions and density of truck routes. And they also had significant, significantly higher levels of air pollutants. Um, then for environmental justice, um, this one focused on examining the role of social vulnerability and environmental justice in neighborhood level hotspots of COVID-19. They used pregnant women with COVID-19 from January to December of 2020. Um, and they used a Kuskal Wallace test. And basically this test determines if independent groups have the same mean on ranks, like it ranks um, the groups. And it was used to compare census trucks for SVI and environmental exposures. And the results showed that 7% of pregnant women with COVID-19 were found in hotspots. 6% in cold spots and 80%, 87% was not statistically significant. Um, there was a correlation between hotspots and higher SVI scores, and hotspots had higher lead exposure index scores and contained fewer people with limited access to healthy foods. Um, so now I'm going to switch to EJ screen. Um, EJ screen is was developed by the EPA and it's an environmental justice mapping and screening tool that provides EPA with a nationally consistent data set and approach for combining environmental and demographic socioeconomic indicators. It has 13 environmental indicators, seven socioeconomic indicators, 13 environmental justice indexes and 13 supplemental indexes. And each EJ and supplemental index combines socioeconomic indicators with a single environmental indicator. Um, so this one was a combination of health and air quality, and it focused on the associates, associations between air pollutants and both COVID-19 prevalence and fatality rates in the United States. Um, there has been an interest in understanding if air pollution plays a role in um, getting COVID-19. Studies have suggested uh, correlations between pollutants like particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide ozone with COVID-19 cases and mortality. Um, so they obtained pollution data from EJ screen from the years of 2014 to 2019. And they considered three measures of pollutant concentrations that included the annual 2016 average PM 2.5 concentration um, the summer months of May to September 26, average of daily maximum eight hour ozone concentration, and the 2014 average of diesel particulate matter from mobile emission sources. And the results showed that counties with higher prevalence rates tended to have younger populations, higher proportions of African American and Hispanic residents, and higher smoking and obesity rates. Um, and yeah, um, pollution emission concentrations, except ozone, were higher in areas with higher disease rates. For fertility rates, higher rates were associated with PM 2.5, diesel particulate matter, and proximity to treatment, storage, or disposal facilities, and demographic factors like race slash ethnicity, education levels, and health insurance coverage also played a role in COVID-19 prevalence. Um, and then this one examined whether non-small cell lung cancer patients exposed to higher PM2.5 levels had increased TB50 
3 mutations, and that's basically a gene that increases the risk of cancer. Environmental risk factors such as PM2.5, ozone, air toxins, cancer risk, and traffic proximity, along with demographic indicators at the neighborhood level, were extracted from the EJ screen tool. And the results show that TB53 mutations were found in 58% of patients, with 23% located in known pathogenic hotspots. B53 mutations were significantly, TP53 mutations were significantly associated with higher PM2.5 exposure, and additional analysis confirmed a higher association between uh, PM2.5 exposure and TP53 mutations. Um, that says the same thing. Um, and then for, um, this one examines if socially vulnerable people live in areas with poor air quality and high sprawl levels. So sprawl is an urban development pattern that is inefficient in its use of land. It's associated with negative impacts like racial segregation and lack of affordable housing. It has been linked to increased traffic volume and global warming. And common variables used to measure urban sprawl include housing density, land use mix, and automobile dependence. And the results showed that urban sprawl was associated with increased ozone levels, especially in low income areas with less education and higher percentages of children under five and less compact areas or areas with less urban sprawl tended to have lower cancer risk from air toxins. Um, yeah, this is the bibliography. So I guess the common theme that I saw was um, like high concentrations of um, air toxins, increased um, cancer or asthma. And a lot of these places had uh, minorities or less access to like health related facilities. Thank you, Elaine. I think that was a great presentation. Uh, you know, I noticed COVID-19 was a common thread that ran through these as well. Uh, also in the chat, I threw a link to the, the only write-up I can find about Carolyn Holtquist's work that she uh, presented to us in our in-person meeting in January. I think that's something that we, we also should take a look at. Uh, I don't have any questions off the top of my head. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, we're, we're, we're missing you today, Tom and Deborah, but I'm gonna send you this video and then wait patiently for your comments. So I'm gonna stop the recording of the video.